Welcome to the second episode of our new lecture series called The New World Order. It is essentially about my book, which is called The Global West versus the Global East, or how the Global South will decide the New World Disorder. Um, this episode is about the introduction of the book, and let me begin by reading the prologue, which actually introduces every chapter in a different form, always about an anecdote. So this is the way in which I try to throw you into the book. Here we go. On the 27th of February 2022, three days into the war in Ukraine, I send a text message to Sergei Lavrov, foreign minister of Russia. Quote, Sergei, please, please stop this madness. You are the only one who can stop him. End of quote. I get a response within a minute. Quote, whom? Question mark. Zelensky? Question mark. Biden? Question mark. End of quote. As a former colleague, I know that Lavrov can be cynical at the best of times, so I try again. Quote, no, you know what I mean. History is on your shoulders. End of quote. The answer blames the West and follows the official line, denazification and all. The FSB is, of course, following his phone, so I realize he won't exactly be saying, quote, sure thing, Alex, I'll call Putin now. End of quote. I stop the exchange after six messages. I'm pissed off and disappointed, to put it mildly. I realize that we are beyond the point of no return. The post-Cold War period is over. The rules-based world order is in tatters. The liberal world order is under attack. Our holiday from history is over. We have entered an age of disorder. And I have no clue what is going to happen next. End of prologue. So this is basically uh, how the book and the introduction begins. And now uh, I'll go through the seven key points uh, of uh, the introduction. The first one is something that I call when a week defines a decade. And it actually begins with a quote from uh, no, no one else than Vladimir Lenin the legendary uh, leader of uh, communist Soviet Union. Uh, he once said that uh, there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And I don't usually quote communist leaders, I have to admit, but, you know, I do think that Lenin uh, had a point. He said this allegedly uh, during the beginning of uh, the Russian uh, Revolution. Uh, now, I take the starting point of the book to be Russia's attack on Ukraine. Now, you could argue that this is a Western view. Perhaps it is. But it is still a violent and blatant attack and violation of all the rules and international norms and laws set up by the United Nations, and of course, the violation happens uh, by a member of the UN Security Council, namely uh, Russia. So I take this as a starting point of the book. And in many ways, for me personally, it's a sequence of three colossal geopolitical events. One was the war in Georgia 2008, which lasted five days and in which I was uh, mediating peace as foreign minister of Finland and chairman of the OSCE. Second, um, the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. I became prime minister uh, a few months uh, after that. And then third, uh, of course, uh, the attack in, in, in uh, Ukraine. And I tried to understand why we were wrong. Why didn't we understand what was going on. 
why did we allow Putin to do the two first, which then gave him an incentive to do the third? The second point of the introduction is something that I called when we thought history ended. And of course, here I go back to Francis Fukuyama's thesis that the Cold War, end of the Cold War, was potentially the end of history, whereby all 200 nations in the world would revert to some form of liberal democracy, social market economy, and globalization. Uh, with the wisdom of hindsight, we all know that we were wrong. But I also explained that, you know, I'm very much a child of the Cold War. I'm born in 1968. Uh, you know, always being quite wary of uh, things Soviet and Russian. I heard a lot of stories from my grandparents about the Winter War and the War of Continuation uh, and the uncomfortable peace that we had to forge with Stalin in 1944, where we lost 10% of uh, our country uh, areas where my grandparents and my father uh, was born. I'm also a child of the post-Cold War era in the sense that I started studying in the United States at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina in 1989 in classes of international relations. Uh, so, you know, by definition, my approach is very Eurocentric or Western-centric or uh, transatlantic, uh, if you will. The third part of the introduction is uh, something that I call when order becomes disorder. And remember, here is where I also talk a little bit about simplification and over-rationalization. So the argument is that the Cold War was bipolar, the Soviet Union and the United States, their allies on both sides, communism versus capitalism, uh, you know, uh, autocracy versus uh, democracy. Uh, you know, control versus freedom. And then we move on to a post-Cold War, which is kind of the unipolar moment. But I do make an argument that after 9-11, early 2000, we start a slow slide uh, towards uh, a multipolar world uh, or a post-American world, where by the words of uh, Fareed Zakaria, we see the emergence uh, of uh, the others. There seems to be no nexus of power. Um, and, and, you know, when the disorder sort of hits on the 24th of February 2022, we suddenly notice that the liberal world order is, atta is, is attacked, the rules-based world order uh, is in shatters, and the institutions that we've established to um, uphold the liberal world order are uh, also uh, questions. Question. The fourth part of the introduction I call why February 24th matters. Now, of course, I could have chosen, you know, many, many days to explain and, and, and signify the change in, in the world order. But my argument is that, you know, we kind of saw a long slide towards change um, and, and you know, 9-11, um, the attack in Georgia, the uh, financial crisis, the euro crisis, um, the asylum crisis, Brexit, Donald Trump, COVID. But really, it comes to the point in February uh, 2022. And for me, that is the end of the post-Cold War era, because in international relations, you have to try to find, define different eras. And if we look at modern international relations, we could argue that there was a period when there was a sentiment or at least a feeling that, you know, history ended uh, for roughly 30 years, a little bit more. Of course, it depends completely on where you come from in the world. I'm not saying that we haven't, you know, had conflict, etc. But I do explain in later chapters more specifically what I what I mean. And now we have an attack on the old uh, order. Uh, and, and the reason I use the Russia's attack on Ukraine is that it kind of forced the rest of the world to take sides, either for, against, or somewhere uh, in between. 
a theme uh, that I will come back to, uh, especially in uh, chapter 2. Now, the third theme that I introduce, oh, sorry, the, the, the fifth point that I introduce in, in the introduction is what I call the triangle of power. Now, you know, as I said, I simplified the world that it, first it was bipolar, then unipolar, and then eventually multipolar. Now my argument is that we don't have exact and closely defined poles, but we have a triangle of power or three power centers. And the way in which I define them is, is uh, the global west, the global east, and the global south. The specifics of which I will lay down in chapters 4, 5, uh, and 6. But at this stage, suffice it to say, and I'll do that a little bit more specifically in the three theses, these are the ones that are deciding the power structure of the world uh, at this particular uh, point. So an old, war, an old era has ended, a new one has not been born yet, and the global west, the global east, and the global south are in an interplay between values and uh, interests. My sixth point in the introduction is when a decade defines a century. So I kind of you know, paraphrase Lenin and I say that, well, if Lenin said that there are decades when nothing happens and then weeks when decades happen, I would argue that there are, uh, you know, centuries when nothing happens and then there are decades when centuries happen. And I, I think this is the decade which will define, uh, you know, the, the sort of generation to come uh, for, for uh, this uh, uh, century. And the big question here is, Will we go into competition, conflict, or cooperation? Uh, probably a mix of the three. Uh, and I also will argue that we'll probably see a regionalization uh, of power. And here is where we come to my three theses of the book uh, to, to finish off with. And please, you know, challenge these theses. Uh, or, or, or send suggestions for others, and I'll, I'll try to take them into account. Thesis number one. We are witnessing a decade of competition, conflict, and cooperation. We're witnessing the end of the post-Cold War era, and this decade will shape our values, norms and institutions for a generation uh, or a century to come. This is the 1918, 1945 and 1989 moment of our generation. In 1918, the leaders of the world at the time got it wrong. It led later to World War II. In 1945, the leaders of the world got it more or less right, because we could say that we lived in an era of relative peace uh, and power division during the Cold War. Relative, I add. And then 1989, I think the leaders of the world got it more or less right. Something's right something's wrong. So this is my first thesis. My second thesis is the name of the book, namely that the new world order will be defined by a triangle of power and a tension between two extremes, the global west and the global east. The global west wants to maintain the liberal world order wants to maintain the current norms and wants to maintain the current institutions. The Global East, China and Russia, wants to break up and change the liberal world order. They want to change the norms and they want to change the institutions. And my argument is that the Global South is going to decide 
this power struggle between the global West and the global East. The global South is not necessarily interested in getting involved between this tit-for-tat fight of the world order between the global West and the global East. They want different things. They want agency. In other words, a voice in the world order. They want to focus on things that matter, that are linked to politics, economics and technology, namely development. They want to focus on uh, food security, they want to focus on energy, they want to focus on uh, economic growth, on infrastructure and uh, on uh, technology. My third uh, and final thesis is that the new world order will be a mix of the old and something new. I haven't been able to give it a name yet, all suggestions are uh, welcome, but it's certainly a mix and there will be a mix of competition, conflict and cooperation. But the key is that we need to find avenues of cooperation for some of the most important common global goods like climate uh, and uh, technology. Now of course in uh, the introduction, I also then finish off by, uh, by uh, giving the structure of the book after the thesis. But that one I talked about already in my first lecture. Uh, I do have a postscript uh, in the uh, introduction with which I will finish uh, this uh, second lecture in uh, the episode on the new uh, world order. And the postscript goes like this. I've thought about the war in Ukraine every day since it began. I've done so as a scholar of international relations and as a former politician. I've tried to understand what is going on and why Russia attacked. Following things on the ground has been easier, understanding why Russia did it less so. Could the West have done something different? Not really, unless it had been prepared to allow Russia to create spheres of interest whilst at the same time sacrificing the sovereignty of its neighbors. The aim of the West was to create peace through cooperation and integration. With Russia, it did not work. Now the only path to peace seems to be the isolation of the aggressor. My text message to Lavrov was genuine. It was a desperate call for help, which I knew that would fall to deaf ears. In the world of international relations, you sometimes come face to face with darkness. You meet people that are willing to slaughter innocent people in their quest for dominance and power. This is why we need a world order that follows and respects certain rules and norms, gives space to the pursuit of legitimate interests, but is not oblivious of fundamental values, the values that ensure that mankind, humankind, can live together on this planet. Thank you for listening to this second episode of our new lecture series. This one was about the introduction of the book. Please let me know what you think about the anecdotes, the three theses, and the contents of the introduction. Next, we move on to the first part of the book and chapter one. Thank <laughs> you.